consultant on the documentary Descendant, which debuted on Netflix last year. I'm sure many of you have seen it. His book will be available in the gift shop for $25. And if you are associated with the university, you get a 10% discount. So I know you want to take advantage of being able to get Nick's book here. Welcome, Nick. We are delighted you are with us today, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, you know, the University of South Alabama was, um, a, the Marks Library especially, was a, a critical resource for me. While I was doing the research, uh, spent uh, quite a few hours there. And uh, so I'm pleased to be um, doing this presentation for the school. Um, so, uh, you know, it's it's always fun for me to address audiences that already are familiar with the Clotilda's history, because uh, I can get into, allows me to get into subjects that um, maybe don't get as much attention instead of just covering the the whole overview of like explaining what the Clotilda was and how it got here, I can I can talk about other stuff. Um, this is so in this case I want to talk about uh, certainly a period in the neighborhood's history that doesn't get as much attention, and um, that's the 1970s and 80s. Um, this was a time when the first big push was being made to get Africatown recognized at the national level as a historical treasure and some pretty some pretty impressive efforts uh were mounted like, to achieve that uh but in the end those did not pan out and as a result a lot of great architectural resources in the neighborhood ended up getting destroyed and um you know in fact one of the things i found in my research is that a lot of the houses that were built by the shipmates uh, were actually still standing as recently as the 1980s. And the state government knew they were there. Uh, some of the descendants of the shipmates were still living in these homes uh, and they did everything they could to stop the demolition. But in the end, the, the state highway department uh, wiped them out anyway. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little about how that happened and exactly what was lost uh, and a little bit about what it, what it means for us today. But first I wanna give uh, a little bit of historical context. <clears throat> so, you know, un until the 1960s, historic preservation was like not really a, a thing <laughs> in the United States with all of this, um, like the prosperity that came in the post-war era and like the booming consumer economy, the growth of the suburbs, the prevailing trend was pretty much to just tear down everything old and rebuild it. Um, I do have some slides here, which I'm going to start showing you. And the first one is a nice shot of the uh, of the um, original Penn Station, which was destroyed in 1963. Uh, if you've um, Um, here it is. Okay. Uh, uh, so this is the uh, original Penn Station, you know, this beautiful neoclassical architecture. If you've been to the current Penn Station, you know, it's not nearly so nice to walk through. This one is almost like a cathedral. Um, torn down in 1963 to build a new one. Uh, of course, the same thing was happening at the neighborhood level. These were the days of urban renewal, a lot of federal federal money going around being used to demolish poor neighborhoods and rebuild them, usually to push the residents out. I also have a photo here of um, uh, a neighborhood in Connecticut where this happened. Also in 1963, same year, Penn Station was destroyed. Um, it's just such a dramatic image. Um, I probably don't have to tell you that neighborhoods of color were usually the ones being targeted for this. Uh, but there was like a growing sense that, that in the 60s that there was something tragic about some of these buildings being lost. Uh, that it, it meant a part of our history was also 
being taken away. And so in 1966, Congress passed the National Historic Preservation Act, and this was the first um, piece of legislation that created ways for historical sites, like say the houses of former presidents or like battlefields from the Civil War uh, to be recognized. <clears throat> So in the first decade or so, hundreds of sites were added to the National Register of Historic Places, but um, only three of those dealt with Black history. And I think two of the three were at Tuskegee. Um, so this brings me to these two guys named Bob and Vince DeForest, who both lived in Washington, DC. Um, Bob is the one speaking in the photo and um, Vince is the one farthest, sitting down farthest to the right. He's the, the one with the beard. Um, and uh, they um, they were both involved in the civil rights movement. And they, uh, in short, like they they came up with a plan to do something about this this um, this trend of Black history sites being ignored. The, um, they created an organization called the the Afro-American Bicentennial Corporation. Like the Bicentennial Celebration of the U.S. was coming up in 1976. They knew that if they didn't get involved, the celebration was going to be totally Eurocentric. It was going to ignore contributions of Black people. Um, so the DeForest brothers were involved in planning in several ways, but the area where they had the most success was... Um, adding something like 70 black history sites to the national register in just a couple of years. Um, and I also, also have this great photo of Marsha Greenlee, who was their, their head researcher. Um, she's, she's also still alive. She thought it was hilarious when I dug up this photo. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, they, I think the federal government was reluctant to add these sites, but the DeForest brothers were just, like pretty savvy operators they had some connections on capitol hill and they were able to really work those and sort of strong arm the park service into adding these black history sites um and the, the congressional black caucus was a big part of this uh so a couple of places on their list were like the the carter g woodson house in washington dc harriet tubman's house in upstate new york uh, but africa town was not on their list I've, I've talked with Vince quite a bit. Um, Bob passed away about 20 years ago, but Vince is still alive. He lives in St. Louis now. And he said, yeah, we just didn't know about Africatown. Like we'd never heard of it in the seventies when, when this stuff was going on. Um, so this brings us to the next character in our story. I wish this photo were higher as this actually comes from the McCall archive at USA, but um, I, I hope it's clear enough on the big screen. Uh, this is, um, I don't know if it helps if I zoom in. Um, this is Henry Williams. Um, he, Henry C. Williams, sometimes called the father of Africatown. I'm like 90% sure that he gave himself that title. <laughs> um, but at the same time, it's not unreasonable to call him that. Uh, he was the one who kind of brought back that that term. So if you, if you talk with descendants who grew up in Africa town in, in those years, in the, the 50s and 60s and 70s, um, a lot of them will say one of two things. Like some will say, we didn't really talk about our family history at home. We didn't talk about the Clotilda. Like our parents seem, uh, Darren Patterson always says this, like our parents seem to be ashamed um, of being so directly connected to West Africa. Um, and uh, which, you know, it's, it's it's striking to hear that because I think in the present day it's it's almost taken for granted that, that would be that that like legacy of struggle is a um, is a source of pride. But um, 50, 60 years ago, I guess um, a lot of people didn't feel that way. Um, so so in some families they didn't really talk about it uh, at home. Uh, and others, uh, like the descendants of Kojo Lewis, uh, have told me that they, they did talk about it at home. They were told all about it by their parents, uh, but they only talked about it at home. Like, they didn't go around talking about it at school. Um, I mean, you, you have to remember that a lot of people living there in, like, mid-century, 
and the neighborhood was big back then. There were, you know, by some accounts, like 15,000 people. Um, it's it's pretty hard to nail that down because the census tracks were never divided up in a way that would let you just like isolate Africa Town as a and you know figure out what the population was. But there were thousands and thousands of people there who had moved from other parts of Alabama, other parts of the South to work at the paper factories, and um, and they didn't necessarily know much about the Clotilda, and. Uh, so it was not necessarily as big a part of the community's own sense of its identity back then. And there were exceptions like Union Baptist also always had a big presence of, of descendants. Um, but but um, it, for, for some people, it, like, it, it was certainly not being talked about as much as it, as it is now. Um, so Henry Williams was not a descendant, uh, but he was intensely interested in, in Clotilda history. Um, he was uh, 14 years old when Henry, or excuse me, when Kudjo Lewis died, and he always said that he had known Kudjo when when he was growing up. And Henry Williams definitely had a tendency to embellish uh, stories, um, but I think it's likely that they did know each other because Kudjo loved the neighborhood kids, and and I think a lot of a lot of kids growing up in the neighborhood, um, you know, spent time around him. And it, it's easy to believe that that would have left a big impression on Henry Williams. So he was a uh, he was a welder by trade. Uh, he had this uh, this welding shop on uh, on Chin Street in Magazine Point, which I also have a photo of here. Uh, he put this together with oil drums that he welded together. Uh, he bought them for ten cents a piece. Um, I really think that he was sort of an outsider artist in, in the best sense. And uh, he also was responsible for designing the first bust of Kudjo Lewis, which was installed in front of the Union Baptist Church in 1959. This previous photo is him posing um, in front of that bust. And uh, so he was the first person to um, start using the term Africa Town in the mid-century. If you go back and read some of the news stories that were written about the community like a hundred years ago, more than a hundred years ago, you'll see that journalists would often call it uh, African town or the African village. But in the 60s, nobody was really calling it that. People would say Plateau. They would say, you know, I'm from Plateau or I'm from Magazine Point or Kelly Hill. Uh, like they would describe the part of the of Africa town that they were from, but they didn't necessarily think of it as as a, a, as one cohesive thing. Um, Henry Williams thought that it was important to have that sense of of neighborhood unity, and bringing back the name Africa town was part of how he did that. And of course, it was also a way of um, like connecting it with the history of the Clotilda and reminding people that it had this this heritage. So at least as early as like 1973. Uh, he was telling, because I, I have a letter from 73 where he says this, uh, he was telling people, um, like, this community is in danger from industrial development. Uh, factories want to take more of the land. They want to build a, state wants to build a highway through the neighborhood. And he felt like the way to fight that was to get people to recognize how unique and historically important Africa Town was and to develop a heritage tourism industry uh, in the neighborhood. That's specifically, that's what he says in this 1973 letter, like Africa town could be a place where people would come from all over the world to learn about this, about the history, uh, to reflect on the legacy of the slave trade. And in the seventies, it was like hardly anyone who would take an idea like that seriously. Um, he was really ahead of his time. Uh, one person who did take it seriously uh, was our next character. Uh, this is John Smith, John Henry Smith. He was a native of Pritchard, uh, played football in high school. Uh, in the late seventies, he was working on a PhD at the university of Wisconsin. Uh, he loved roots, uh, the Alex Haley novel. And he was visiting Mobile at one point in the late seventies. And he met Henry Williams and he heard about the Clotilda and he felt like, how have I never heard about this? Like, this is 
this is a lot like the story of Kunta Kinte. It's like thoroughly documented history and it's right there in my backyard. It's like right, it's happened like right near Pritchard. Um, and, uh, you know, he didn't know about it till he was an adult. So he, he became obsessed with the Clotilda history. Uh, his wife told me, uh, Dr. Barbara Wheat. Um, so he decided to move back down to South Alabama and, uh, at the urging of Michael Figures, uh, his friend who was the state senator, um, John Smith ran for mayor of Pritchard in 1980, and he won that election. And he decided he was going to put Africatown tourism at sort of the center of his agenda. And he had this idea that Pritchard could also become a link between West Africa and the rest of the United States. He wanted it to be a trading hub for West African countries as well as a tourism destination. So in 1983, he gets Howell Heflin, uh, who some of you might remember if you've been in Alabama for a long time, uh, U.S. Senator from Alabama. Uh, he was he was uh, a judge before he went into politics. He had that big square jaw and um, people. He, his nickname on Capitol Hill was Judge. And so John Smith approached him about creating like an Africa Town National Park, and. Uh, and he was um, he was up for it. He said, "Yeah, sure, I'll do what I can to help you." So he introduced a bill to that effect, and uh, I have a transcript of this this hearing where they're defending the bill in a, a committee, and they say, "Look, like we know that maybe it doesn't meet the criteria to be a national historic landmark. Um, it doesn't have maybe it doesn't have all the architectural uh, resources that you're supposed to have." But in that case, just call it something else. But the federal government should give it some kind of recognition because it's obviously such an important historical site. And the Reagan administration fought this. And they said, like, look, this uh, doesn't look or feel like a historic community. Like, look at all these factories around Africa town. Look at all these railroads. Uh, a lot of the, the historic buildings are not standing anymore. Like the church has been rebuilt, the original school um, was rebuilt. And um, so so they said it didn't qualify, but they also admitted that they had not really taken a close look. They hadn't really studied it to see what what kind of architectural resources Africa Town had. And um, they said, if you want to give us money to go down there and survey it and see if there's anything that might qualify it, then we're up for that. Um, but in the end, this never happened. The survey never happened. And I I have this suspicion that I, I, I couldn't find any way to prove that um, that lobbyists from the paper companies may have had something to do with that. Um, so John Smith uh, took this proposal to state government of Alabama. Uh, he asked if Michael Figures could help him and uh, Bill Clark, another state senator who um, who had Africa town roots. Um, they fought for it for a couple of years. And uh, at the state level, we do know that the paper companies like fought this thing tooth and nail. I have a clipping from Scott Paper's uh, internal newsletter, which it would send around to employees. It has a headline that says, um, it's, it's something like the Africa town historic project, uh, a threat to business. And they were afraid that if Africa town got this kind of historic recognition, then it would come with restrictions on how much pollution they could put out or like would stop them from expanding in the future. So in the end, um, an Africa town state park was created in Pritchard, but the bill had been watered down so much by that point that uh, there were no protections for the actual historic center of Africa town. It was basically the bill was, was pretty much meaningless. John Smith was thinking, well, at least it will allow me to, it'll still be a springboard for economic development, but it didn't really speak to the priorities of, um, of Henry Williams and the descendants who were most concerned about this preservation project. <clears throat> so, uh, so John Smith did have some success in the 1980s. Um, he was putting on these Africa town folk festivals and um, 
I have a really good photo from one of those. Um, this was supplied to me by his family, uh, by by his wife Barbara Wheat. So that's Henry Williams, um, and on the on the right in the tan suit, and then John Smith standing up on the left hand side. Um, so yeah, these these Africatown folk festivals went on throughout the nineteen eighties. Some of you might remember them. Uh, John Smith spent a fair bit of time in West Africa himself, and he was able to bring some West African officials to Pritchard for these festivals. He was so proud of having them there. I find it kind of touching. And uh, so there were there were concerts at these these festivals. There were lectures. Henry Williams would give tours of the neighborhood. And uh, these things were actually covered in the national press. There was a story in um, Zyder Life magazine or Time. I, to me, they, <laughs> they were interchangeable. Um, and, uh, they, you know, they would, the Associated Press would would write about them and put stories on the National Wire. And um, there was a twinning ceremony, they called it, in 1985, where Pritchard and Weta, <clears throat> the port city in West Africa, where the Clotilda left from, they became sister cities. And um, Alex Haley and Dick Gregory, the comedian, who was also, you might remember, he was a, a civil rights activist. Um, they were both there in the auditorium in Pritchard for this ceremony. And uh, it was, it, yeah, I think it, it got some some play uh, like at the national level in the, in the press. Um, but at the same time that all this was happening, Africatown um, was also like still being targeted for a lot of unwanted development and uh, the attention that it was getting from the press and from West Africa wasn't really, didn't really um, give it like the tools that it needed to, to fend off those incursions. And so there are two incidents in particular that I want to call uh, attention to. The first one is 1985, uh, the same year that that twinning ceremony happened. There was a warehouse company that wanted to rezone seven acres of Africa town for industrial use. And um, Henry Williams and a bunch of others went to a city commission meeting and asked them not to do it. And you know, this is when the city commission was just three members and um, it was also like created such a way, like very deliberately, probably a lot of you know this history. Uh, it was, it was, um, they had at large elections to like uh, to ensure that that it, um, white people would always have control of the city commission uh, that it, that there would um, as long as um, the majority of the voters in, of, in Mobile overall were white they would be able to elect the whole slate of um, of commissioners and and it wouldn't be at a neighborhood level where like majority minority districts could elect um, you know a, a person of color to represent them. So uh, somebody from the representing the warehouse, uh, I think it was their lawyer, um, he was like, look, the, the landlords, um, like the family has been here since the 1850s, since before the Clotilda came. So really they have more right to it than, than, than you know, these descendants do, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> it's a little shocking to read that in the news coverage, but that was what they said. Um, and uh, so then uh, this woman, Clara Eva Allen Jones was also there. And um, I have a photo of her here. Um, she was uh, she was known around the community as Mama Eva. I don't know how exactly how old she is in this photo, but at the time of the meeting, she was 90 years old. She was the daughter of Polly Allen, who was on the ship and um, so it was this, was this amazing thing where a, you know a, a person who was only one generation removed from from um, from the voyage from the founders of the the community she was still alive as as late as nineteen eighty five, and uh, and she said to the commission, this is all in the newspaper report. She said, um, she said, I'm begging you with tears in my eyes 
please leave us alone. She she talked about her father and what they had gone through to establish Africa Town, and the city commission would uh, was not won over. They rezoned the land anyway, voted two to one, and Henry Williams said, and what I think is just a heartbreaking moment, and that um, it's it's this also it's also in the news story. Um, he said, "We have not had one white friend stand up for us," and um, it really underscores the sense of isolation that that they felt. Um, it's in in that way, it is a contrast to um, to what we're seeing in the neighborhood these days. The other thing I want to, the other event that I want to talk about from 85 is the construction of Baybridge Road as we know it now. So um, this is the original Cochrane Bridge. It was built in the 1920s. Uh, it, uh, its main purpose was to serve the factories that were close to Africa Town. You couldn't take hazardous cargo through tunnels because that was too dangerous. You had to, if you were carrying hazardous cargo, you had to take it over a bridge. And the only place, um, for a long time, the only place in um, in the county, or at least, at least anywhere close to the city where you could take it was over this bridge. And as of the 80s, uh, the bridge needed to be replaced. It was old, it was, it had been corroded by pollution from the factories. It was also a drawbridge. And um, so uh, it would create these big traffic jams when people, when trucks had to wait um, for the, the bridge to um, open or close. So it needed to be replaced. And there were two proposals for how this could be done. One of them went through factory land. The other one went through, um, through the neighborhood. Um, they needed like a, a more robust highway that was going to be able to carry hazardous cargo. And so it was a question of where it was going to go. And the state engineers wanted to take it through the factory land. That seemed like the logical way to do it. But the companies didn't want that because it was going to make them pause their operations for months while the construction was going on. So they hired a former speaker of the Alabama State House of Representatives, Sage Lyons, um, hired him as their attorney to fight it and um like surprise surprise the state eventually gave in to what the factories wanted and um henry williams and others had been fighting this but um they they, they lost that fight so uh so there were all these houses along this corridor um where uh where the where well it was it was Baybridge road back then too it was just a, a different it just looked different it was not as developed um it was not a five way in you know 60 mile an hour highway um there were all these houses along the corridor and i have some photos uh of some of them um it's hard to say exactly when they date from probably they were built in different periods but um the uh, so I'll just scroll through these. I really like this this one in particular. These are all from the Mobile Historic Development Commission. Um, and uh, this last one is 500 Bay Bridge Road. And this one is actually the house that uh, Kajo Lewis built. Um, at least like the core of the houses, I know that it has this, you know, it doesn't look like a house that was built in the, the 19th century or early 20th century. But um, I mean, the family knew, you know, the family knew <laughs> like what, what the house was and it had been renovated and expanded over the years, but um, but like the core of the house was built by Kajo. And uh, so, um, so 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 a, a bunch of other houses is, along this corridor as well i think about 10 or 12 of them were like according to the to the sort of oral history that you know that had been handed down by these generations which it was not that many generations like about 10 or 12 of these houses had been built by the shipmates um uh the descendants fought hard to stop the state from from um from 
building the factory in this area. And it came to a point where the state said to them, look, if you want to pay uh, yourselves to have these houses relocated, that's fine. We won't stop you, but we do have a construction timeline and like, you've got a cutoff point. Like, if you don't get them out of there by, you know, July 1st of 85 or something, then we're just going to wipe them out. And I think two or three of them were saved, but the, the rest were destroyed. Um, that um, highway construction also led to a uh, demolition of part of the cemetery that's still there. There, I couldn't find any records of, of these graves, but people who have lived there forever do remember them. Um, they, it was like an informal, I don't even know if you would call it an extension of the cemetery because it might've been as old as, as, as the rest of it. But um, yeah, there were, there were, uh, there were grave sites there that were not super well marked, but everybody knew that people were buried there. State destroyed them, paved over them to build this highway. And uh, they, and then after this, after the highway was built, uh, it started causing all this storm water to rush off into the cemetery and it caused uh, like rapid growth of, of, um, of, well, weeds, plants, trees, like, push graves up out of the ground, move them around. Henry Williams um, in the in the 90s wrote to the city attorney saying, could you guys please start sending somebody to mow this cemetery on a regular basis? And um, they said, yeah, we don't think so. That would cost too much money. And um, in the, the mid 2000s, an archeologist um, from College of William and Mary in Virginia came to um, do some cleanup on the cemetery and map out the graves and um he found that that all of the um the growth caused by the storm water had been like massively damaging to the cemetery and if, had they done what henry williams asked them to back in the 90s just started to do some basic routine maintenance like mow it once or twice a month then um a lot of that damage could have been avoided of course in the end uh, they did rename the bridge when it when the new one was built, um, the Cochran Africa Town Bridge, and I have a couple photos of what it looks like now. Um, uh, they renamed it that way on a request from Henry Williams. The the Mobile Register even in an editorial um, said, "You know what? We think this is a good idea. Yeah, that like the state should rename it the Africa Town Bridge," and it, it seems like. It's a lot easier to convince them to do something when um, the interests of these industrial companies were not uh, at stake. <laughs> like it didn't cost anybody anything for the the bridge to be renamed. Um, so they they kind of made the best of it. Uh, it. Had a ceremony when the new one was open. So at any rate, um, John William or excuse me, um, Henry Williams died in two thousand eight. John Smith died in I think 2006, and neither of them, um, of course, lived to see like the the opening of the Heritage House or um, or all of the national attention that the, the neighborhood's gotten in recent years. Uh, in 2012, Africa Town was added to the National Register. The city even helped it um, get that designation. Uh, and I would say there's also been a lot of progress at the, the national level the National Park Service is like actively helping Africatown with the Blue Way. And they, um, you know, they, they hindered its, the community's interest back in the 80s. Uh, overall, the discipline of historic preservation is like more diverse now and less racist th than it used to be in the 80s. Um, and obviously, there are many examples now of, of other people um, in Mobile, other people outside of Mobile, um, including people like me, um, including <laughs> white white people who don't have Africatown roots, um, doing what we can to, to help the neighborhood. Um, and um, so I think all that's encouraging to see, but I, I guess I just wanna say that there was, uh, it's, it's really sad to think about um, I'll, I'll turn off the, um, the sharing. 
it, it, it is sad to think about all the resources that we lost back then. I mean, it, it's, it's really wild that the park service said, oh, there's nothing historical in Africa town that would qualify it for this kind of a designation. And, you know, had they done that survey, it could have set this, they, they would have found those houses that were still intact and it could have, there could have been an alternate history could have set in motion this, this other chain of events where, um, Perhaps it would have gotten some kind of um, designation from the federal government, and perhaps those houses would have been preserved, and perhaps, um, perhaps the highway wouldn't have been <laughs> built right through the neighborhood center. Um, we did lose a lot back then that can never be recovered, uh, but I guess I think that, um, like, to excavate the history of what happened then is worth a lot on its own, like at least. The stories don't have to be lost to memory and um and we you know we should remember that the history of this neighborhood didn't stop when Kojo lewis died in 1935 and then just pick up again 10 years ago when when the world started to become aware of its existence again and um and i i think it's i, I guess in closing i think it's important to um to honor the memory of these people who kind of fought for the neighborhood's interests and for its preservation um, in this period in between in the period when, when um, the period between the lives of the shipmates and, and the present day, uh, because there's this whole legacy of struggle that extends across the 20th century um, that, uh, that I think kind of bridges, bridges the present day and, um, and, um, the period that's more familiar to us, the period of the when the shipmates were still alive. So that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to to take any questions. Looks like Dr. Looks like Kern, Dr. Jackson, you've got a question. Yeah, Nick, I might have missed this, but I, I think it might be worth saying something about Dr. Gene McIver's work with uh, Mayor Smith and them, and the fact that some of those festivals. Um, the African American Studies program at the University of South Alabama, when it was court ordered, uh, it one of the first things she did was uh, join forces and connect the infrastructure south to host uh, some of the African dignitaries out to Berkeley Field, but also to be a part of sort of the brain trust. So I, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Jean McIver for her role in all that with, uh, you know, Henry Williams and, and Mayor Smith and the like. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I'm glad glad you brought that up. Um, um, yeah, it's uh, the, the and and to remember that the university has a long history of of um, of joining forces with the community too. Nick, can you hear me? I think you can. I can. Okay. My name's Lisa, and I'm going to be helping out moderate questions in here. here. But I wanted to show you the room in here. So these, everybody can wave. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Great. All right, so I think you can actually hear them if they ask questions. So if you all have a question in here, you should be able to say it and Nick can hear you. But then online, if you want to put it in chat, I can read it out loud to the group here, or you can unmute as current. Kind of Sounds good to me. Elijah. Um, uh, what are some further steps that we can take as citizens of Mobile to better preserve Africatown and other historically black um, monuments and places? Um, you know, I guess I always defer to the community groups about what they need, but I would say um, get in touch with them. <laughs> I mean that when when Descendant came out, they set up this fantastic website. Uh, is it descendantfilm.org? I think um, I'm gonna. Um, it's important to get this right. So um, maybe it's .com. Um, I mean, I don't think there's a better portal. It is descendantfilm.com. I don't think there's a better portal than this one um, for like connecting with the groups that are that are spearheading the work in Africatown. Um, there are ways to um, 
I think ways to donate, but also ways to, especially if you're in the city, um, you know, ways to to connect with them directly and and um, uh, and and find out what they need. So I would I would say, um, you know, speak with speak with them, speak with, get involved with Chess, get involved with with me, Jack. Um, talk with the Descendants Association. Uh, just go to descendantfilm.com. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, we can wrap it up. If, um, they are recording this. Nick, this is Jen. Thank you so much for doing this for all of us. And, and I want to thank you all for, for coming to the museum. And um, this has been really awesome. We're so grateful to have you. We just have a question. Oh, question. Here we go. Yeah, I have a question related to what you talked about today, which was great. But uh, what projects are you currently working on? That we can look forward to seeing later. What am I working? What am I working on now? Um, well, um, I've just been for a lot of the year. I've been um, just doing shorter, shorter pieces, um, newspaper and magazine pieces. I um. Am shipping away a new book. I am shipping away a new book. I don't know if you can. Okay, I am shipping away a new book proposal, but I'm not quite ready to talk about that yet. Uh, <laughs> I haven't shown it to my um, my publisher yet, and um, so we'll see how that goes. But I hope that within the next couple of months, I might have some news about that. But I will say it's another project that sort of um, sort of um, brings together. Uh, history and investigative journalism in the way that this one does and uh and involves some similar themes uh, you know i'm very interested in like urban anthropology and um these the forces that kind of shape communities and shape cities and um and and shape our lives in a way and uh and so the the next project also involves um, involves some of those questions. I have a question in the chat too: How I got um, interested in the African Africa Town story and, and connected with the community? It's, uh, a good question. Uh, it goes back to 2018 when the book Barracoon was coming out. You're probably all familiar with it. Um, Zora Neale Hurston's book, uh, or she. She narrates the life of Kojo Lewis. Uh, it was not, it was, she did the interviews in 1927, 28, wasn't published until 2018. And when it was coming out, I was at New York Magazine and my editor called me in one morning and said, hey, uh, this book is coming out. We're gonna publish an excerpt of it in the magazine. And it would be really nice if we could also have a story about uh, what became of the descendants of, of this person, Kojo Lewis. So see if you can track them down. And um, and she was like, and maybe we'll, you know, we'll send you to Mobile. <laughs> but first, you know, see if you can find them. And it took me a week or two to, to identify any of them because they had always intentionally kept a low profile. Eventually, I did connect with um, Gary Lumbers, who was living in Philly at the time. And he was a great, great grandson of Kojo. And uh, when I first got him on the phone, he said very forcefully, you don't need to be worried. You don't need to be writing about the descendants. You should be writing about the neighborhood. He was like, what did they do to Plateau? How did it get to be this way? He was like, when I was a kid, it was this thriving community. And he said, now it looks like a war zone, in his words. And uh, so um, I did manage to visit uh, that same week. I was already on a on a reporting trip for something else. And the place left a big impression on me. And um, I kept thinking, I wish I could just, after I came back to New York and wrote about it, I, I had this recurring thought, I wish I could just move down there and, and piece together the entire history and really take up that question of Gary's, like, what happened to it? And I guess the way I was thinking about it was what's the connection between all of this factory pollution and the slave ship? Uh, I felt like if I could piece that together, then it would reveal a lot about how 
uh, how environmental racism works everywhere. So I uh, reconnected with some of the people I had met uh, when I visited, um, and I, I I met some more people. I went down again after the the they announced that the ship had been identified, and uh, and I asked everybody, "What would you think about me doing this?" Like I'm, you know, white journalist from up north, no prior connection to this neighborhood at all. Um, what would you think about me doing it? And the response I got for the most part was um, like, look, we need all the help we can get. So if you're going to do a responsible job of it, then we would love to have you. So at the end of 2019, I I was uh, packing up my apartment in Mobile and or in New York and, and moving to Mobile. Um, we had another question from the audience. When you answered the first question, you mentioned DJAC. Could you explain to people who might not know what it is? Yeah, what MEJAC is, yeah, it's the Mobile uh, Environmental Justice Action Coalition. It was established in, I think it was late 2013, back when there was that fight over um, like building a new pipeline through the Big Creek Lake watershed, uh, like building it actually under, under the lake, um, and also a plan to install a bunch of new petroleum uh, tanks around Africa Town. Mejack is not just an Africa Town organization; it's it's um, the whole city. Uh, it was born out of this collaboration between people from Africa Town and people who, who worked with like the Sierra Club um, and otherwise worked on environmental stuff in the the city. Um, great respect for for that organization. And uh, then. I also have a question here about uh, the role of the mayor family and whether or not my book uh, explores the family's role. It certainly does. <laughs> uh, I would say that um, that I mean I would say that you're that this is by far the most um, like comprehensive treatment of the mayor family and its role that you're going to find anywhere. I was able to. I, I feel I feel like they have always been sort of, um, especially talking with people around Af Africa town, there is this sense of mystery that surrounds them. And also this sense that they're um, monolithic, like it's just the mayors. And um, when I was starting in my research, I thought, well, you know, there are a bunch of members of this family. I'm sure that, um, I'm sure that like there's some difference personality, some difference of opinion between them. And I wanted to see if I could kind of explain who they were as people um, while also charting like the transfer of wealth between the generations and the ways that they had contributed to um, to uh, the industrialization of the land around the neighborhood. And I was able to find really quite a lot. Um, I mean, when one more shocking revelations was I was looking at that um, Joe Mayer's will. He is the one who died in 2020, early 2020. And I forget why I was looking at his will, but it was there in probate court. And it says something like, when I die, um, I want all of my money to go to my business partner. But if for some reason he's not in a position to receive it, uh, then I want it all to go to the Jefferson Davis Shrine in in um, in Mississippi. Uh, what is it called? Bouffois. And uh, so so um, I never managed to speak with the Mayer family. I tried and tried. I actually thought they were going to speak with me this year, um, but then they just dropped out of contact with me. So uh, so yeah, never um, never got to interview them, but I did. Uh, I did manage to piece together a pretty complete picture of of, um, of the family, which you'll find in the book. <laughs> okay, so then we had another question in here. Um, were there any historical figures that you already had knowledge of or historical figures that you were surprised were a part of this story of this constant local fight for the preservation of Africa now? Um, like, like figures, um, I mean, there definitely are people whose whose um, lives kind of intersect with the neighborhood in interesting ways. Uh, 
Booker T. Washington uh, visited a couple of times. We have, uh, he met people who were on the Clotilda and he, he wrote about it a little bit. Um, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, of course, um, I mentioned, yeah, I mentioned Alex Haley and Dick Gregory. Jesse Jackson visited several times in the 80s. Um, I feel like I have a couple more of those. I mean, there's um, the writer Albert Murray, who I have to say I didn't really know about before I before I moved to Mobile. Um, in fact, I think Kern, our, our own Kern Jackson is the first person who who told me you got to start reading Murray. Uh, Murray was was a, a literary icon in his own right, um, associated as much with Harlem as he is with Africatown, but he grew up there. So yeah, I think throughout throughout Black history, uh, throughout the history of the neighborhood, you can find a lot of these these connections with um, like more famous people who uh, visited there or had some some involvement with Africatown. I hope that I hope that's what you meant <laughs> by the question. Great. Well, I certainly want to give um, Nick Tabor a, a round of applause. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. This has been a pleasure. Great to have you on behalf of the um, Archaeology Museum, the English Department, and the Department of Communication. Um, it, it's been just, it's been such a pleasure to host you. Thanks again. Thanks again. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you.